I'm going to call the live Finance and Law Subcommittee to order. It's uh, Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. And if you're watching at home, we're back in the council chambers, so to speak, committee chambers. And the first item on the agenda is to take roll. And Mr. Souza is? Present. Mr. Fury? Present. And uh, Mr. S <coughs> also accompanying us is uh, Superintendent Cabral and uh, Assistant Superintendent Monahan. First item on the agenda this evening is student activities. We don't have any, and I imagine now that we will probably start having them as the weather's getting better, but as of tonight, we don't have any. Second item is an update on the quarter three budget FY21 appropriation, our revolving accounts and grants. And I'll let Ms. Monahan say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, as you look at the first one in your finance and law packet is the FY21 appropriation. Here is our line item, and currently we are at quarter three, which is three quarters of uh, the way into, into our uh, school fiscal year. At the bottom, you will see that right now we have expended 57.23% of our budget. So that is actually, if you think about it, less than three quarters of, our, of, us, of the budget. And we are at the quarter three. And then, of course, as you see the uh, last column, the percent expended, some of the ones that are a, a little bit higher are your classroom supplies, which is line item 2430, where we're at 94%. But of course, our classroom supplies were just about over for the school year. We won't be purchasing much more than that. Um, another one, as we are higher than what we expected to, or we budgeted, is all the way down towards the bottom, which is 4,400 technology maintenance and supplies. We have expended a little bit over $100,000 under that line item. And of course, with, um, with COVID, we had gone ahead and, and tried to budget as much as we possibly could for technology but we did go over on that line. And as you see also, there are some lines that we did not budget for, but those lines are the ones that we did um, use grant funding. So that's where you see the, um, there's no percentages on those lines. Some of the ones that we will continue to look at is our transportation line, and our transportation line is uh, 3,300, where currently we are expended 41% of our budget. And yes, now that we are back into school five days a week, uh, my staff has gone ahead and done a great job by forecasting how much more uh, we will need to encumber. And so we will con continue watching that line, but as of right now, we seem to be, pretty, we seem to be fine in, in what we feel that we've encumbered. Any questions on that? From the committee members, Mr. Souza. Thank you, Chairman Martin. Ms. Moynihan, this, we have in the first week in May, so will we get an encumbrance list sometime in June as far as what we're going to encumber for the rest of this, at the end of this year? Well, we usually can encumber through August. Usually we can do such a thing, but I can go ahead and submit um, what we have projection. encumbered. As a projection? As a projection, yes. We are trying to go ahead and I've uh, challenged our girls, well, they challenge me all the time too, they are seeing to see where are we with, um, you know, they're looking at our open POs, checking to see where, um, if we have anything that we can, um, and making sure that we don't have any, ex except maybe a little bit more money than expended. And so we feel that we're gonna do our best in trying to pay out our bills as quickly as possible, but yes, we will usually have an encumbrance list. And on the technology line, we'll use, um, when, when the committee probably, the first meeting in June usually authorizes the balance, the balance the line items that are unbalanced. It's actually this one. Today. It's actually this one. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, that, gives, that, that gives them 60 days, 60 to, days to do it. To do it rather it than 30. Today. I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little older. My memory isn't as good. So, so that answered that question. So then we can stop balancing those out and maybe use some of the COVID money or whatever the case may be for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You want to continue? Sure. We'll do the uh, motion at the end. Okay, that's fine. The next one is our revolving accounts. And as right now, as you see, currently we have just over $4 million in our revolving account for quarter three. We, um, and again, I don't have to go ahead and read it to you. You'll see what we have coming in, what we've expended in each line. We are probably going to see another one to two payments of school choice. 
So we should probably see another $100,000 going into our, um, into our revolving funds. So we should be, um, if we're expending wise, I don't see it right now. There could be some expending through E-rate and other lines that we may need to, but we should be just around $4 million or a little under $4 million at the end of quarter, at the end of this fiscal year. Any questions on the revolving? Mr. Fiore. Thank you. <clears throat> I assume a lot of it is more stable than most years because of the COVID grants. We're probably not hitting them as much. You're right. If you notice there, we haven't really expended too, too much in many of our line items uh, of our revolving. And um, in some of them, we haven't received much revenue either because of COVID as well. Yeah, and, th and those are designated, um, those designated revolving accounts. So those will just carry over. Correct. And the last one is our grants update. Currently, we have just about $12 million in grants. The last, th uh, the last of the one, two, three, four, six grants at the bottom of, uh, uh, of the list are the newest, uh, the newest ones that we've just received. And of course, they're also new to the district. And you will see the manager of those uh, funds and also the purpose of each one of those grants. Um, one of them, of course, is the 119 COVID prevention grant. Um, and that's also for COVID support. We have a GLEAN grant, which is literacy with uh, Dr. Sarah Buckley at the high school. Jennifer Andrews is doing a FAFSA one for the high school students and staff uh, or guidance staff. And so right now we have just about $12 million in our grants. We are monitoring our grants, making sure that we are expending uh, the, the funds that need to, be fun need to be expended by the end of this year. So we won't be returning any funding to the federal or the state. And that concludes the quarter three budget update. If anybody has any questions. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. motion to be in effect if you would. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, motion made that we accept the reports FY21 uh, quarterly, third quarter budget updates for FY appropriation revolving in grants. And oh, and um, allow the allow the administration to balance the unbalanced um, line items in the budget. Second the motion. Yeah, we, I'm sorry. Yes. With surplus from the accounts that are that are that, well, um, that have have, it, have it, balance uh, covers that that balance covers that. So we're just taking from uh, an appropriation from one budgeted item, offsetting another budget that went a little over. That's all. So we're not adding any extra money. It's just about taking from one that's over, from one that's under to one that's over, and balancing. That's all. That's the motion, Mr. Fiore. I seconded it. So motion is made and second. Any discussion on <coughs> committee members? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, so voted. And uh, finally, the third item on the agenda this evening is bills payable for FY21 of $288,147.06. And I, I don't have any questions at this time. Mr. Souza. Thank you, Chairman Martin. On page 17, I don't remember seeing this before. I'm just, just curious on it. Is it, is it, Wally Computer Associates, 17, second one up, 14,860, instructional hardware, 21, so it's going to it from a grant. It is um, a new, it is a new, one of our newer vendors that we have been using, Wally Computers, and what we ended up purchasing were um, some power outlets for the use of uh, charging our Chromebooks when students bring in the Chromebooks and, into yep. the building. And we talked about that, mm -hmm. that how, how, how are they going to, once the kids come back, yeah, how are they going to char charge all the Chromebooks during the day? Right. And that, that's what that's for? Correct. Those are all surge protectors, and we've um, purchased them throughout the district. So students, we do have the Chromebook carts that you can charge them. But again, if a student has their Chromebook in front of them, they need that, and they can actually, and if they didn't, if they didn't charge their Chromebook, they can charge it during class yeah. using one of the surge Use protectors. Use it and charge it at the same time. I'm sorry? Use it and charge it at the same there time. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, will we accept the, uh, will we pay the warrant in the amount of 820, excuse me, $888,147.06 as presented? I'll second, I find nothing unusual. You said 188. What did I say? <laughs> 200, let me, let me start again. 
<laughs> what are you doing with the other 100,000 there, David? It's been a long day. And I work with numbers the whole day. Can you imagine that? 288,000. One hundred and forty-seven dollars and six cents. I'll second that. And a motion remains second. Any further discussion on the uh, bills payable? Uh, Mr. Uh, I didn't call roll on the others. Uh, you don't have to because we're in person. We're in person. Right. No, I forgot something. And uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. I want to go back to item number two, if I could, for one second. And uh, we should have under. Uh, the budget update for quarter three also made a motion to allow the administration to prepay uh, first quarter tuitions for, for, for FY22 for special ed. Motion to allow the administration to pay. Prepay, uh, prepay. Excuse me, to prepay FY22 special ed tuitions as needed. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, so voted. And it's not on the agenda, but it uh, usually is a, a question we ask Ms. Monahan at the end. How are we doing for uh, facilities? Are going great. Facilities. Our facilities are back into our building, so this is exciting. We are fully staffed. We have the facility that we Any further issues for finance and law? Motion adjourned. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Thank you, Mr. Souza, Mr. Fiore. Thank you, Mr. Jakes. The May 5th, 2021, Taunton School Committee, I call it to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled then I yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Lord, as we begin this session, let us acknowledge your goodness and mercy and ask your blessings on all our del deliberations. We thank you for this opportunity to be of service to our community and to the young people entrusted to our care. And on the roll call, you want to sit first? Okay. <clears throat> roll call, Mrs. Fagan. Ms. Doherty? Here. Mr. Pulowski? Here. Mr. Fiore? Present. Mrs. Fagan's present. Mr. Martin? Present. Uh, Mrs. Almeida? Present. Oh, that's, that would be you. Mr. DeMello? Present. And Mr. Souza? Present. 
and I'd also like to ask for a moment of silence. Uh, we've lost uh, three people in our community recently. The first one is Sean M. Doherty, who was 27 years old. He was the son of Jake and Lisa Doherty. He was also a graduate of the Taunt High School class of 2011. He loved sports and playing outdoors and all those things. He is also survived by two siblings and several other relatives. So please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. The second one is Maria Ilda da Costa, who died on April 17th this past year. At the age of 93, she left quite a large family. She left her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. So, she was described as a poet, a good singer, and devoted to her Catholic faith. And among her grandchildren is her granddaughter, Dalila Mendoza, who was a longtime employee of the Taunton Public Schools and is now the director of English Learners. The last one is Stephen M. Keneally, who uh, died also on April the 17th of this year. He, is, um, he was the husband of Cindy Cornelia. He had a, a tragic accident on the workplace and he had a heroic battle trying to overcome the devastating effects of that injury. He also leaves um, his two daughters. His wife has been a longtime occupational therapist for the Taunton Public Schools. Please keep all these, these people in your thoughts and in your prayers and a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Moving on to item B, approval of the minutes April 7th, April 21st, 2021. So moved. Second. On the motion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Item C, student council representative. We don't have one here, we don't have one virtually. We'll move on to public input. Wendy, do we have any public input? Thank you. Uh, next item E is superintendent's report. I will turn it to the superintendent of schools, Mr. Cabral. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. And before we begin, I do want to recognize and thank all our teachers as it is Teacher Appreciation Week. All our teachers were treated to some sweets that were made by the Culinary Art Department at Taunton High School. Uh, with the support of our students and delivered by our storekeepers this morning. So congratulations and special thanks to our teachers. It's been a very, very uh, trying year, but our teachers have risen to the occasion and I hope they appreciate uh, the small gesture as a sign of gratitude on behalf of my administration and the school committee. So in my superintendent's report, I'll share with you some outstanding news and some great work regarding students at the high school uh, going on to pursue college or going on to post-secondary pursuits, as well as the work that this committee has supported uh, going back to 2015 to increase participation in the PSAT. So the Tom Public Schools has, is implementing district-funded exams in school day testing since 2015-2016. The district has seen the PSAT and SAT participation rates and test scores skyrocket since implementing this program. Participation rates on the PSAT have more than tripled from 10 to 30 percent to 50 percent for the S and 50 percent to the SATs. By eliminating obstacles such as cost and transportation and offering the exam during the school day, we have seen that when providing access and opportunity, our students have risen to the occasion. So since 2015, approximately 90 percent of eligible students at Taunton High School have participated in school day, PSAT, and SAT testing and we have seen the scores increase from an average of 470 to 490 to 489, 505. In total for this fiscal year or this school year, we've had 100, uh, 326 students out of approximately 400 juniors take the SATs, which is an outstanding number. However, due to COVID and despite many students opting to learn remotely in colleges going test optional only for this year, 
We are still very pleased with that high number of turnout. Ideally, we'd love to see that number of 400 students, but we're proud to have 326 students take advantage of this opportunity. In addition to our work with PSATs and SATs, the Taunton Public Schools has also implemented crucial programs that have provided greater access to post-secondary opportunities for all students while offering targeted support to economically disadvantaged, traditionally underrepresented, and first-generation students. The district offers college prep test courses and a senior seminar elective that focuses on test preparation, college applications, and other career opportunities. The district also hosts numerous workshops throughout, their, throughout the students' junior and senior year to, and for parents to learn more about the college application process as well as a college or a summer college boot camp for rising seniors. Taunton High School's guidance counselors have also been very busy and more, and more recently recognized by our partners at Bridgewater State University who sent us a very nice email uh, exemplifying or identifying the amazing work that is taking place within the guidance department of Taunton High School. So Bridgewater State University complimented the guidance department for driving high college application numbers to Bridgewater State University. So we're also trying to replicate this work at one of our partnering schools in southeastern Massachusetts at UMass Dartmouth. So I hope to have some good news regarding some increased applications at UMass Dartmouth. So we feel in Taunton between Bridgewater State University, UMass Dartmouth, Bristol Community College, and Massasoit Community College, there are plenty of opportunities for students to stay close to home and receive a well-rounded education. So the Taunton Public Schools year-to-day applications increased by 7% in the middle of a COVID year. From December to February, Bridgewater State University saw Taunton High applications increase from 64 applications to 117 applications in just two months. This is a phenomenal accomplishment since there is a national trend of fewer students applying to colleges this year, especially those, again, who are first generation, low income, or students of color. In addition to our partnership and our work with the four surrounding universities and junior colleges, we also want to recognize that our students have achieved at a very high level. We have students who will be attending Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Dartmouth, Brown, MIT, John Hopkins, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Villanova, Notre Dame, and the United States Military Academy at West Point, just a few outstanding universities and colleges that our students will be attending. So in addition to our work with PSATs, SATs, and, and students having access to high quality post-secondary education, we've also emphasized through the state, uh, through a competitive grant that we applied for and received, Taunton High School guidance counselors have also assisted our families with the free application and federal student aid, which is known as the FAFSA form. Guidance counselors have conducted FAFSA outreach through offering after school, evening, and school break one on one virtual meeting sessions for families in need of additional assistance with the form. This work has been supported by a competitive grant offered by DESE in the amount of $10,000. The good news is, because we've demonstrated such a high rate of achievement through this grant, we anticipate that we will successfully receive an additional grant when we reapply because of the outstanding work at the high school. Taunton High School also partnered with a U Aspire, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission for ensuring that all young people have the financial information and resources necessary to find affordable college options to participate in the FAFSA professional development training. It also provided a hotline number for students and families or guidance counselors to have questions answered that they could not answer in real time. So again, we want to thank our guidance counselors. We want to thank Mr. Barada and also uh, Ms. Ms. Andrews for her outstanding work in support of our juniors and seniors at Taunton High School, as well as guidance counselor Gay. We also have an update in my report uh, on fall sports. So we try to mix things up with academics and extracurricular activities. So as all of you, due to your support, Athletic Director Mark Adavianelli is excited to share that as of April 26, 2021, every athletic team at Taunton High School has had the opportunity to hit the playing field just about just about uh, to start the final season during the pandemic so as you know this year we instead of having a traditional three season 
or three seasons, we have four seasons because of the way the seasons were split out to ensure that sports and student athletes were able to participate socially distanced in a manner that was safe and also due to the slow rollout of guidance on how to carry out these sports in a safe way. So you know there was an abbreviated fall two season which began in February. This made it feasible for all teams to participate throughout the school year. Students were able to successfully compete against other schools and when students could not compete against other schools, they were able to compete against each other and also to practice with other teams or with, other, with their teammates within the Hockamock League. I also need to compliment our coaches. So not only were our coaches challenged with coaching our students in the pandemic, but they also had to address the social, emotional, and health needs and wellness needs of our student athletes. So every student was treated as an individual knowing that this was a very difficult year and it was different than the norm where students you know, were at school and could exit school and go to the practice field where many students had to make arrangements or had to find ways to get to the practice field or many students to help support their families had job commitments or work obligations. So again, considering everything, we find that this was a very successful athletic year or as we continue to emphasize in our classrooms health safety and engagement we also continue to emphasize health safety and engagement on our athletic fields so we understand that all our teams want to win and put their best foot forward but we would never do that if in to jeopardize the health safety of our students and our coaches as we know there was a rollover effect into our classrooms so i want to credit mr otto vianelli sandra altman the athletic administrator christine Kurt, Lauren Wilkie, the athletic trainers, Karen Regan, our nurse manager, and all our staff, and all the support staff who helped make the four seasons successful. We are done with tryouts. I believe we already had some scrimmages for the spring season, so we look forward to seeing the boys and girls lacrosse teams in action, the boys and girls tennis teams in action, the baseball and softball teams in action, volleyball, wrestling, boys and girls track and field all in action. So. Those will be starting soon, and I'll make sure everyone has a schedule if you wish to attend any of those events in the near future. Also want to give a shout out to our pre-K through seven science coordinator, Liz Palowski, for helping to conduct a virtual invention convention. So through, as last year we learned, anything is possible if we put our mind to it and we get creative and, and think strategically. So for several months, elementary students from across the Taunton Public Schools designed innovative inventions as part of the virtual invention convention. And when you hear about some of these inventions, I have a funny feeling we're going to see some of these kids on Shark Tank in the very near future. So due to the pandemic, we were, the virtual science fair invention convention was held virtually, supported by Google Classroom. Uh, in March, students from grades one through six created short video presentations and winners were chosen to participate in the Massachusetts Invention Convention through the LaMelson MIT. Last week we learned that we have some incredible young inventors here in the Taunton Public Schools. And I actually had to Google and research some of these inventions because some of these I have, I have not heard of and I wasn't aware of what they were. So we have a fourth grade student from Mulcahy, Mackenzie Gentile, who won an industry award for an animal care category for her project on, horse man, on a horse manure hauler. We, have, we want to congratulate Molly Abbott and Mackenzie Cardoza, grade four at the Bennett Elementary School, who won an industrial award in the consumer goods category for her project, uh, uh, project the lightning lid. We also want to recognize second grader at the Galligan Elementary School, Lillianne Keister, who won the, an industry award for sports, toys, and games category for her project, the sleepy unicorn. Additionally, we have two big winners who were invited to the Raytheon Technologies Natural Inven National Invention Convention in May. Sadie Rezar, who's a grade two student at the East Town Elementary School, she came up with a project called the Moogle Shield. So I had to reach out to uh, Liz to get an explanation on what a Moogle Shield is, and it's pretty creative. It's a three-in-one face shield. It's a face shield it's goggles and it's a mask all in one. So something that was created out of necessity during the pandemic. Uh, we want to also recognize William Lefebvre. And when I spoke to uh, Mrs. Palowski, she was almost literally in tears explaining this invention. So this invention, which is a VR2, it's a virtual reality mask. So this young man, uh, William Lefebvre, created a mask 
for autistic stu a virtual mask for doctors to use when treating autistic students to help alleviate the fear and anxiety when autistic students report to a doctor's appointment during a pandemic. So again, you see two inventions that came out of necessity during a pandemic. And again, I would not be shocked to see these kids in the near future on Shark Tank or someone uh, replicating these ideas uh, on a larger scale. So congratulations to these amazing students and we want to thank all our teachers and our coordinators for their outstanding support. Uh, as you know how passionate I am about STEM and this just goes to show when we put these resources in the hands of our kids and we allow them to be creative, sky's the limit. I also want to just remind you and bring you back to some work that I'm participating in with six other superintendents from Bridgewater Rainham, Brockton, Fall River, New Bedford, Seekonk, Somerset, Berkeley, in Taunton. As part of our work in the past, we've collaborated on the Student Opportunity Act to help bring awareness in much needed reform. We've also worked collaboratively in southeastern Massachusetts uh, to bring awareness to many social justice causes. So now our next project, which has been very successful, was to develop a grow your own pipeline right here in southeastern Massachusetts. So the seven superintendents all partnered and we presented topics, administrative topics, to help bring awareness so that when prospective administrators or administrators who are currently serving in an administrative role, we want to make sure that when they hear Student Opportunity Act, when they hear Circuit Breaker, when they hear Chapter 70, that they have some kind of familiarity or they have some kind of awareness of what these topics are and the role they play in the day-to-day -day role of administrators from assistant principal, coordinator, principal, central office to superintendent. So the topics that we covered included school finance and operations, special education law, hiring, retention and firing, teacher evaluation and feedback, and strategic communication. I want to mention that Taunton was represented by four aspiring administrators or administrators, current, current seat, seated administrators. We want to recognize Raphael Dowd for his participation. He's the assistant principal at the Parker Middle School. We want to recognize Elizabeth Pulowski, who's our pre-K through seven science coordinator and the district administrator for her participation in the program. Chamberlain Elementary School assistant principal Julie Pelletier is also participating in the program. And Lisa Pereira, who is the teacher slash assistant principal at the Letty School for participating in the program. On April 28th, Superintendent Thomas from the Brockton Public Schools and myself, we presented our webinar, which was on finance and operations. I included the flyer uh, that was shared with staff members throughout all those school systems. And also, I provided with you the PowerPoint presentation that Superintendent Thomas and I uh, presented to the 20 plus administrators. I have three talking points that I'll share with you quickly. So the first talking point is regarding Welcoming, welcoming our students back. So we are proud to say that we have about 75% of our student body attending in person five days a week. So that's about 5,888 students, 75% attending in person. 25 students, 25% uh, chose to remain remote, which is 1,917. And you have this information in your packet. You can pull it right off of your COVID dashboard. That's where this information is coming from. So on April 26, we welcomed back our 8th graders, our 9th graders, and our 12th graders. And on May 3rd, we welcomed back our 10th and 11th graders. So as of today, all our students are back full-time, in-person, five days a week. It's a tremendous accomplishment when you consider that there are some school districts that are still struggling to bring back elementary and middle school students. And when you also factor in the fact that the Commissioner Riley, I think it was about a week, a week and a half ago, announced by May 17th he wanted high school students back in the Taunton Public Schools. Thanks to, the, thanks to the tremendous work of our leadership team, our building principals, and our coordinators and our teachers that we were able to get our students back into school well before the timelines set forth by the state. And that's also a credit to the school board for your outstanding support in allowing the administrators to do what we do best, which is figure out complex problems and bring kids back into our schools. I also want to just compliment the high school staff. As you know, we have 2,700 students who attend the high school. So by allowing the high school the opportunity to gradually bring students in, they were able to adjust their bandwidth in classrooms and adjust their bandwidth in cafeterias to make sure, and I say cafeterias plural, as we are using multiple spaces to feed our students, to make sure that we had the appropriate bandwidth to successfully 
feed all our students throughout the lunches during the school day. So that was a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, the only negative that I would say so far has been the increased traffic in the morning. I know it's added about five to seven minutes to my commute, but it's not a bad thing to be stuck behind a bus when it's full of students who are going to school. So that's a nice problem that I'll, that I'll deal with any day, and it allows me to spend more time with my partner uh, in the morning on, my way, on the way to school. So I also want to recognize and state proudly that the Taunton Public Schools will be hosting a in-person or an in-person graduation this year for all graduates at Taunton High School or all senior students. So just some key points that I wanted to point out to the committee and that I wanted to share with the public. So we will be holding an outdoor graduation on the football field on June 6th at 11 a.m. We have also scheduled I'm sorry, June 5th, Saturday, June 5th, we will have our graduation. The rain date, the makeup date will be set Sunday, June 6th. Both graduations will be held at 11 a.m. All students will be seated, will, be, will sit in their traditionally assigned rows, which will be 10 students per row, and there will be strict three feet separation, as well as a volunteer seated at the end of each row. We are reminding everyone in attendance that you must wear masks. The downfall of hosting an in-person graduation with a graduation class of this size is that we are limited in the number of attendees who can attend. So each graduate will receive two tickets, which was a reduction from the normal four tickets students have received in the past. This will be a contactless or paperless graduation, so we will be using QR codes that people will need to scan in order to receive their tickets and their information. All guests will be asked to register accordingly with SC guidelines prior to the graduation for contact tracing purposes. Everyone must agree to not attend the event if they have any symptoms or have been a close contact. Guests not of the same family will be asked to remain six feet apart in the stands. And students will cross the stage three feet separated, designated by markers. They will pick up their respective diploma off a table. They will turn their tassel before leaving the stage and have pictures taken by a professional photographer at designated areas throughout the football stadium. Mr. Jakes and his staff will also be busy on graduation day, knowing that we are limiting attendance to two per family. Mr. Jakes will be streaming the event live so that everyone at home can watch, or people who live outside of Taunton can also watch on YouTube. And we also want to remind everyone that Mrs. Moynihan and the high school staff and the groundskeepers, we're going to, be, we're going to make sure that appropriate hygiene, cleaning, and disinfecting protocols are established by the DESI guidelines, and we'll, we'll make sure that people are stationed at the restrooms to make sure that the restrooms are clean, that the restrooms are restocked. We'll also make sure that the restrooms at E-Pole are open and that the restrooms at the stadium are open. We want to make sure that we do this correctly and that everyone feels safe and everyone in attendance feels comfortable attending this in-person graduation. And last but not least, any, uh, I want to provide you with some updates regarding up the, uh, ongoing work regarding junior prom and senior prom. With regards to junior prom, uh, the juniors are meeting with the Titan High School leadership and the Titan High School advisors who oversee the junior class. They are meeting and right now considering postponing their prom until the fall. The junior class advisor will inform Mr. Matos of their decision by Friday. And the seniors are considering an outdoor off-campus gathering at an event place after graduation, which is one of the things that DESI has advised or asked that we do. If we are gonna have a senior prom, they ask that we consider doing it after the seniors have been let out of school in the event of COVID or in the event of spread, because the students will be out of school at that point. So those are the three, talk, oh, one more talking point. In addition to being high school heavy today, I also wanna mention that uh, elementary in middle school, principals are working with Mrs. Perry and Mrs. Moynihan to prepare their end of the year events, their end of the year send off. We also want to be cognizant and also remind the public that we have students who attend in person and we have students who are attending remotely. So whatever we plan at the end of the year, we want it to be inclusive so that students who are remote or students that are in person are all able to attend and they don't feel excluded. With that, that concludes my report. Any questions? Ms. Doherty. Oops, gets complicated, doesn't it? Masks, glasses, foggy glasses. 
Uh, to the qu question, I'm looking at the dashboard uh, and uh, the looking at the total number of students from the 16th to the 30th, the two-week gap of a drop of 191 students. If I'm doing the math correctly, do you have any, is there any reason why that drop has occurred over those two weeks? Because it doesn't appear as if they're absorbed in the hybrid or full remote. Yeah, I'm not able to answer that question, Mrs. Doherty, so I'll have to research that with uh, Carolyn Billineau, who oversees our student management system, uh, School Brains, to identify why the loss of students. I wish I understood a word you were saying, Superintendent, but I, sorry. <laughs> Just pr trying to practice what we preach. So I will reach out, we, we will reach out to Carolyn Billineau, who oversees our student information systems, School Brains, and to identify where or why we lost our students. Um, I, that's a great question, and we need to be able to account for the students, so I will get that information to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Thank you, Superintendent. Any other questions? The chair will entertain a motion to accept the So report. moved. Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. On the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moving on to administrative business staffing report. Stephen placed on file. Second. I hear a second. Um, Mr. Mr. Fiore, on discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need to be recorded as president. My wife's summer school appointment is on the list. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. On the motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We have one present. Get that, Wendy? Thank you. Subcommittee reports, finance and law, 5521, Chairman Martin. Finance and law made earlier this evening with myself, Mr. Fiore, and Mr. Souza. <coughs> also in attendance were Mr. Uh, Cabral and Ms. Monaghan. The uh, items on the agenda, first one was student activity accounts. There weren't any this evening. Uh, second item was an update on our uh, third quarter budgets, FY21 appropriation revolving and grant appropriations. And a motion was made to accept those reports and uh, also to allow administration to balance the line item budget for the uh, close of the year and also to uh, prepay first quarter special ed tuitions as we have done in the past with circuit breaker money. And again, as I said, that motion passed the Finance and Law Subcommittee. I also mentioned at that time that if anyone who was not on the subcommittee had any questions, now would be the time to bring it up uh, on any of those uh, budget updates. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mello. Mello. Thank you, Chairman. So uh, specifically item two, correct? That's yes. we're talking about. Okay, good. So uh, on the, uh, the quarterly financial report, um, on transportation line 3300, I was uh, able to listen in on the original subcommittee meeting. Uh, I, I guess my question is, so we have $8.2 million uh, appropriated and we've spent $3.4 million. Of course, these are all uh, rounded off numbers. So am I safe to assume that we're not going to expend the entire $4.8 million that's left in the budget? We due to the fact that we are now... May whatever, May 4th? We're going to see a substantial savings in the transportation line item, Mr. DeMello, because, again, when we started the school year, there was 10 days where we started late, uh, not started late, 10 days where teachers were provided with transportation. So we are typically a 180-day school year. So our school year was shortened by 10 days to 170. So we will see a savings on those 10 days that we did not run or transport students. And you also want to re remember that we were a hybrid up until, up until early March, I believe, or April, April 5th. We were hybrid till April 5th. So we were only running our buses on Monday and Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. So we will see a savings for every Wednesday we did not run the buses. So yes, that'll be one line where I anticipate we'll see a substantial savings. And that savings will be used to offset deficits in any lines as authorized by the subcommittee. And that savings will also be used to prepay quarter one tuition for out of district special education students, which is an allowable expense. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Superintendent. So, uh, and we're not going to come back from our local transportation company to say that we owe X amount of dollars because we didn't use the full contract, correct? That's now established that. Without going into the an executive session meeting that was held earlier in the year, uh, the answer is no. Okay, great. Thank you. And if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, on the between line 4400, technology maintenance supplies where we're way over, which I completely understand. And we have, I, I believe Ms. Monaghan explained, if there's not a percentage, it's because we're, it's, it's the federal monies and so forth. So line 2451 and 2455, instructional technology and hardware software, which are also running in the negatives. Uh, could, can, can that be elaborated upon once again on 2451 and 2455? Ms. Monaghan? Thank you, Chairman Souza. Uh, Mr. DeMello, yes. Yeah, so what happened is when we initially started our line item budget, we did say that we were going to um, offset that budget line through grants. But then, of course, hitting those lines in grants, we also had additional, fu additional funds or additional invoices that had to hit those, those budget lines. So that is why we had, we're, that is also the reason why we are overexpended on that line because we expended more than we had anticipated using the grants funding. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ms. Monaghan. Yeah, if I could, if I could just elaborate on that too, Mr. DeMello, it, with through the grants, there are some expenses that cannot be charged to grants. So I anticipate without looking through those bills, but I'm sure there are some items that are charged to those accounts that could not be covered through the grants. So they would have to be charged to the budget, which again, we will offset like we've done in the past with any surplus from other lines that are in excess. Great. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, just one last comment on the revolving accounts. Um, at the meeting that was held last week by, by uh, led by Mrs. Doherty, the special program subcommittee, I asked a question about uh, CPAC monies and that they had uh, X amount of dollars um, that were, and I, I hope I'm explaining this correctly, that were part of a revolving account. Is that on this list or should it be on this list? It's, it's part of the best donation. I know uh, this has come up time and time again. Why do we, do we still do best? Why is it still called best? So, but the best donation account is where we put revolving funds or donation funds or where we've established the, the CPAC donation account is in that line item. So the $9,000 that the CPAC has raised is part of that, is part of that 67, 67, eight balance yep. that you see at the end, Mr. DeMello. So is there a way in the future to uh, delineate that, expand upon that, or does it have to be classified as best? Okay. I think there would need to be a motion to create the account. I, 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 yeah, I think I'm going to defer to Chairman Martin from Finance. I think the quick answer to that is these these um, these line items have been established with the auditor's office. You'd have to do the through the law, and in order for us to do that, it's a process. So Mr. we'd have Martin. to make a motion at the uh, school committee level and uh, to the uh, city auditor to uh, create a revolving fund. So I imagine we'd go through the same procedure to modify or edit one to change the name. Uh, as we all know, well, most of us know, there was a best account years ago and uh, best program. And that's where the best came from. Uh, it seems kind of uh, inappropriate now because it doesn't exist as we originally saw it. So at some point, maybe if people were to get together and come up with a, a, a name that was more appropriate for what's in that account or what that account is used for, bring it to the school committee make a motion to ask the auditor to authorize changing that name. I don't believe it would be a problem. It's just that it has to be approved by the auditor. Right. I, I mean, and again, because the concern is that the numbers that were given at that meeting last week was around 9,000 and change. So since there's $67,000 there, you know, what are the other accounts? Well, we could do the same thing we do with athletics. We could have sub-accounts. Okay. So we could have an original account and then break it down into sub-accounts to handle uh, the issue you just mentioned. So is it appropriate that I make a motion at this I, time? I, I, I or that's maybe, not appropriate? I think maybe what we'll do is let the, let the administration um, come up with some names. Come up with some name. What happens is the donate the best donation, they just change that from, from best to and they apply all the donations that they get in and that and then they have a sub list of what the donations are. So what we could do at the next meeting in finance is let the administration come up with some names or some way to dig to uh, 
how should I put delineate. it? Delineate. Thank you, that's mm -hmm. what I was looking for. Delineate, uh, and maybe we can come up with an additional one or two so we can see the delineation. And then come up with a, then come up with a list of what's in, what's, in that best, what's in that donation account. It's really a donation account. We could scratch the best and just call right. it a donation account. But would, yeah. Like you said, Chairman, would the uh, associated accounts, sub-accounts, yeah. or We could come up with a whatever. list and, a, and, a, and an amount. Th that yeah. would be great. And that I, just, great. I just want to state, too, the donation accounts that have been established on behalf of schools, we just help the schools spend the money appropriately. We don't tell the schools how to spend the money. So that donation Mr. account, Chairman. for example, has a Friedman donation account that I established when I was the principal. There's still money in that account. So if Mrs. Kurt wants to use it on graduation or wants to use it on a, an appropriate expense, she processes the money. Mrs. Moynihan generates the PO, but we don't tell her how to spend the money, just like we wouldn't tell CPAC how to spend their money. We just hold the money so that when it is expended, there's a paper trail. <laughs> there's a paper trail in that we also know that the more we do, the more we do with our internal systems and controls, the less chance there is for inappropriate use of funds. So that's why I prefer to have everything on the books through a revolving account or on the appropriation versus dealing with cash in our schools. So I would be you know, a, a strong supporter of having donation accounts with every school so that there's checks and balances to make sure that the funds are used appropriately. Makes perfect sense. Well, we'll have Mrs. Moynihan, Mrs. Moynihan do that at the next uh, finance. We got Ms. Um, uh, sorry, Mr. DeMello. Great, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Ms. Ms. Uh, Almeida. I'm sorry, there's no way for me to contact That's you. okay, go ahead. Um, thank you. My question would be on that, revolve, that specific revolving account, BEST. Over the years, we had had businesses in our community who contributed to that um, account. So how much of that is recent money versus how much of that is old money because the old money was specifically for project best and to be distributed equally among schools and it was a certain amount allocated per student in every school so how much money do we have in there now it's a uh, 30 uh, yeah 67,800 and so where did that money come from is it old money or new money? Mr. Cabral. Uh, this is complicated. Time out. <laughs> I need one of those Moogle masks. I would have to go back, but I would highly, I would bet that most of the Project Best money is gone, uh, Mrs. Almeida, because Project Best, wow, we're talking probably 15 years, maybe longer since Project Best. Most of the funds in there would be donation accounts established by our schools. And uh, the two that come to mind would be Friedman. When I was there, I established a donation account with the business manager at the time, Mr. Martin. I know the high school received a donation this year for uh, water filling stations in the amount of $10,000. So, so it'd be mostly donation accounts or donation funds received by our schools or business partners that made donations to the schools. But we will check, but I would expect that all the old money, quote unquote, has, has been spent and that these are funds that our principals have access to now. Uh, okay, because the point I'm trying to make is that that money is um, and has always been specific for a, like you said, a water cooler or whatever, that was specific for that. Was that money spent specifically for that? So I'd like an account a breakdown of that account to um, be able to make an informed decision on that. Thank you. Thank, that, thank you, Mrs. Al Mrs. Almeida. I think the appropriate thing to do is we'll ask the administration on the new business, Mr. DeMello, if you want to make the motion, just to provide us with an update on that best donations and what's in there. And then uh, we can make a, uh, any recommendations that they have to subdivide it through the auditor's office, if, if, if need be, we can talk about that at the next finance and then at the next committee meeting for the, to, for the wraparound on it. Well said, Chairman. So moved. No, at, at <laughs> <laughs> on the new business. How's that? I'll make a deal. <laughs> Ms. Doherty, uh, on the same subject? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question to Mr. Cabral about leadership donations. 
what is that? What's the source of that revenue? What is it used for? Leadership donations would be very similar to what we just explained. It'd be donations made to schools that we deposit into an account. So we will provide you with a breakdown on BEST, and I'll provide you with a breakdown on the leadership donation so you see uh, what accounts, uh, where the, oh, leadership donation, sorry, it's been, a long, it's been a long week. Leadership donation, that is the $75,000 that was donated to us by Bristol County Savings Bank to support our social and emotional learning initiatives. They committed $25,000 over a three year period. I believe we are in year two, so we should have one final installment next fiscal year, which is FY22. So leadership donation, I believe, is more of a district level, whereas the best donation is more on a smaller scale with, the, with our schools. But we'll provide you with that breakdown. <coughs> All set, thank you. Mr. Ch Mr. Martin, Chairman of Finance and the Law, please continue with your report. Well, I just want to add to the uh, situation here on the donations. I know when I was the Assistant Superintendent, we would periodically get donations from individuals, from companies, and we could not cash that check, obviously. <laughs> we needed a place to put it. And since it was a donation, we would go looking for a revolving account that referred to donations. So that's how a lot of these line items that say donation came about. Because as a <clears throat> uh, school department, we don't go to the bank and cash a check. We have to go through the process of being uh, approved by the school committee and so forth and so on. So we would, <clears throat> we would certainly want the money, but we had to have a place to put it. And so if it was a donation from a company, from an individual, for, for a school, uh, as Mr. Cabral stated, you know, like for Friedman, uh, we would just uh, deposit it into a donation and City Hall would take that money and make it part of that, uh, that revolving fund. And that's, that's, that's been in place for years. Uh, and it, for any particular group to know how much money is in their uh, portion of that revolving fund. Uh, we've never really had a problem with that, but I can see as things get more sophisticated of uh, maybe having some sub-accounts under that donation uh, line so that we can earmark money to go into a certain area like CPAC and, and things like that. Mr. Doherty. Just uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. So uh, as we started this conversation about this particular report, uh, I think that perhaps it was you, Mr. Martin, uh, that said that this, these, some of these questions come up on a regular basis or periodically, at least annually, uh, and the explanation, which was a little bit muffled about how the process by which we would alter some of the, some of the line items. So it might be well for us to change the report itself uh, while we're in the process of really looking carefully at each one of these line items and breaking them out as particularly the one, uh, the best line that Mrs. Almeida is talking about, and maybe the report should delineate uh, what, what is in that account. So my recommendation, I think that was what Mr. DeMello said, I support that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Mr. Thank Martin, you. please All continue right. with finance. You <coughs> Item number three. Okay. So uh, again, we approved the uh, Balancing of the budget and also for uh, first quarter donation uh, tuitions, not donations, first quarter tuitions to be paid uh, prior to uh, the start of the year. In number three, we had bills payable in the amount of 200, 200 Mr. Sousa, remember, $288,147.06, and that motion, uh, uh, motion was made to pay the bills, and that motion carried. Also, quickly, Ms. Monahan gave a kind of a quick update on uh, facilities. Obviously, students are back, things are going well, teachers are in their classrooms, uh, custodians are doing their jobs on a regular basis as they had been right along, but maybe a little bit more attention now that there are more people in the building. Uh, and uh, basically, things are just going well as we uh, sit here. And that's the report of the Finance and Law Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, Ms. Doherty? I'm sorry. Um, just. One more question, so, and I guess it's to, to the superintendent or Mrs. Moynihan about the grants account financial report. I noticed that a significant number of these grants appear to 
have an end date uh, in June of 2021, some of these line items, if not all of them, have pretty substantial sums of money remaining at this point in time. So two things. One is that going forward, we might want to add a column that shows the true balance of the grant at the time the, the report is uh, put before the school committee so we would know where we are. And the second question, maybe more complicated, is Mr. what happens to these balances which are pretty substantial in some of these grants? So most of these grants were allowed to carry funding over. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of the report, Mrs. Dory, that there is a line titled carryover grant funds. So most of these grants, we are allowed to carry over a certain percentage that's not expended. So we will spend down the grant accordingly, and as we've done in the past, which is sound fiscal management, we will carry over whatever percentage we're allowed to carry over to the next fiscal year. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Okay, where are we at? Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to accept the Finance and Law Subcommittee report and adopt their recommendations. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Fiore. On the motion, uh, a discussion, Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through either the superintendent or assistant superintendent of finance. On page five, um, the uh, public relations invoice of 999, please refresh my memory. I know that there was something in the effects of ten to $12,000 that the school committee approved, which I voted no to um, have this public relations firm on board. Is this 999 in excess of what the school committee approved or is this part of that? Well, this is part of it. The auditors have requested that we pay on a monthly basis, that we don't pay ahead in the event that we uh, don't receive services rendered, but the auditors ask that we pay on a month to month basis. So if I may, this is for the month of what month is this 999? The month of April. Month of April. And, and so in May, we'll see the same thing? Correct. We, okay. did, we took out the initial um, from the warrant before the $12,000. As Superintendent Cabral said that the auditors asked for uh, a monthly invoice instead of a yearly invoice. And that's the reason why. So we did break it down to 12 months. So this one currently is for the April. Invoice. OK. And uh, lastly, uh, what did we get for $999? A lot. So in addition to helping with press releases, uh, they also helped put together a video at no additional cost for our virtual job fair. They worked with the HR department to develop the flyers, to develop the communications. They supported me with my communications, with our press releases that we sent out. So uh, quite frankly, I feel we are getting, as I share with the leadership team, in addition to myself, Mrs. Perry has utilized them in communications to our families regarding COVID-19. I know Mr. Barada has utilized their services with communication. So we are taking full advantage uh, of their services to help with our communications uh, internally, as well as our communications externally to the public, and as well as getting ahead of information so that the public hears the narrative from us versus hearing narratives that are spun by uh, people who want to portray the top public schools in a negative light. Okay, so uh, you're, not, you're not saying they gave us more than what we paid for, are you, for the month of April? I am, I would, I will not, I will not utilize them above and beyond what we are contracted for. So there's a specific list of services that they provide us with for the $999 a month. That is all I plan on using them. If I was going to use them for more, um, quite frankly, I wouldn't because I feel what we're getting from them covers what we need right now. Uh, based on the needs of the district, which is exactly what we have been asking for probably for, this, for several years, is to have somebody to assist us on a day-to-day -day basis with internal or sensitive communications that will protect the district and not put the district in harm's way, but also portraying the district and highlighting all the positive work that has taken place throughout our, throughout our school system. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. There's a motion on the floor. On the motion. Uh, and by the way, Mr. Chairman, I'm voting present on that line on uh, on voucher number 15620 in the amount of 999. When did you get I could that? Could amend that, please. Thank you. Uh, on the motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
DIs have it, and Wendy has the pre the president on that uh, pot, Mr. Mr. Mo. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Unit A Teacher Subcommittee 51521, and that's myself. Unit A Subcommittee met on five. Uh, excuse me, 415. Uh, myself, Mrs. Fagan, Ms. Al Mrs. Almeida, Superintendent, and uh, leadership team members. And we are working on a successor agreement to the teacher's uh, TEA contract, and the negotiations are ongoing. Motion to accept the report. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Next item on the agenda is the Committee of the Whole for 2821, as myself. And uh, that was the FY, the report of the Committee of the Whole is FY21 Budget Workshop. Administration made a presentation on uh, various scenarios, and uh, part of it was restoring some positions that were reduced to the FY21. and. The other part of it was how uh, recommendations and uh, advice on how we are going to use the additional stimulus money from the federal government, and that is ongoing, and we have another budget workshop on 5 12 21. And that is the report of the Committee of the Whole. Motion to accept the report. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Opposed? Chairman. Yes, Mr. DeMello. Uh, I'm just going to vote what present on this because I did not attend. So how do I vote? I'm not voting vote no. Present. Okay, I'm voting present. It, 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 either one because even though you didn't attend, you're still a member of this committee standing now, so you can accept the report. Whether you attended or not is, is not really, it's okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the special program subcommittee for 29-21. Ms. Doherty is the chair of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Souza. It occurs to me as I'm about to read this report that uh, it would have been more beneficial to the committee had I placed the report in writing so that they would um, have the report. I think that we, we have basically abandoned writing our reports for committees uh, over time, and we might want to consider at some point in time to revisit that. It just seems much more practical um, to do that than to have to listen to uh, in this instance, a fairly lengthy report. Um, so the second thing is that I would invite my colleagues uh, who are members of the subcommittee, uh, Nat Palowski and uh, Greg DeMello, to when I am finished writing the re uh, reading the report, presenting the report, to chime in with something I might have, have overlooked. And lastly, Mr. Cabral did put his notes in writing and provided them to me later, uh, late this afternoon, and I will most of actually what he prepared in writing, I added to the report previously, with the exception of a couple of things, particularly the issue of the budget item that we have already talked about. So there's no need to repeat uh, that at all. So the special uh, program subcommittee met on Thursday, April 29th, to consider several requests that were put before us by the Special Education Parent Advisory Council uh, requests that, uh, in their opinion, and hours at the end of the day that would enhance their work on behalf of families and children in their purview. CPAC, which is the acronym, is an organization required of us by the Mass General Laws, Section 3, Chapter 71B, just for the information of our listeners. That it further requires that the CPAC serve in an advisory capacity to the school committee. Members present were myself as chair, uh, Mr. DeMello and Mr. Palowski as members of the committee. Uh, representing CPAC were Heather, Heather Bailey's Gregorius and Joanne Delosheri, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who are co-chairs of CPAC and Superintendent John Cabral and Special Education Director Judy Mulrooney. In a previous meeting that we had and reported to this committee at our last meeting, uh, we reiterated at this meeting uh, the, that the subcommittee had recommended to the school committee that we meet with CPAC two times each year uh, in a formal way, i.e. presenting to the school committee as required, and then informally meeting with the uh, special program subcommittee so that we would be meeting with uh, CPAC four times a year in order to address their issues and concerns and suggestions going forward. 
the first meeting with uh, school committee for CPAC, as we have agreed, will be sometime prior to the end of this school year so that we would get in that meeting uh, prior to the end of the school year. So we will go forward with that. It will be placed on the school committee calendar by Mr. Cabral. And I think uh, Mr. Cabral said that uh, Wendy Devine was working on that, working on that schedule. Judy Mulrooney reported that during this past year, despite the COVID, uh, they held workshops and meetings planned by CPAC uh, along with the uh, special education department, and that, as a matter of fact, those meetings were well attended. And I at least find for myself that when I have attended Zoom meetings, and perhaps members of the committee as well, that it was easier to leave the kitchen downstairs with a cup of coffee and go upstairs and sit without having to travel back and forth to a meeting. So these meetings were pretty well attended by staff and parents alike. Uh, Ms. Mulrooney also said uh, that her office and CPAC uh, at least planned will meet quarterly on an agreed upon schedule and that concerns about communication that have been raised by CPAC over time have begun to be addressed. Uh, CPAC raised issues of concern including uh, storage space, things that they have that would allow them to continue to function as an organization. And that issue is on its way to being resolved. Mr. Cabral suggested that space at Friedman uh, Middle School would be available to them in the Learning Center, that there are cabinets there, uh, a table, desks, and so forth uh, that they could certainly avail themselves of. So we'll put a check mark on that item. Uh, they were um, also concerned about visibility on the Taunton Public School website and uh, the ability for people who were going to the website to access CPAC more easily. And Mr. Cabral, between meetings, the last meeting on the 29th and the previous meeting, uh, had instructed his staff to begin to work on that aspect um, of their concern. So that's well on its way, if not already solved. Uh, communication to schools and families uh, is important to CPAC. So they had asked if they might have access to our email system, the uh, contact information for uh, special education parents particularly as appropriate, and I'm assuming that that conversation will ensue uh, when the need arises. Uh, the ability to place CPAC announcements and events and workshops in school newsletters and on their websites and their ability to distribute flyers school by school was also a request, and there was no objection by a superintendent to have that, to have that happen. Uh, further, we discussed the importance of recognizing the accomplishments of all students in the school, including special needs students, and that all children should be included and encouraged to participate in school events. Uh, if accommodations for special education children needed to be made in the context of these events, the CPAC folks and parents are quite willing to work with the administration of those schools in order to help to consider any accommodation that might have to be made uh, for children with special needs in those schools. So the idea, of course, is to be more inclusive and to have our children, all our children, feel like they're in school and they're participating fully in those activities. Um, so I think, and so finding a way, is the other thing is for us to, that special education children have some extraordinary accomplishments as we well know. And so uh, we are committed to helping to find ways in which those accomplishments of those young people can be brought forward, much like we bring forward uh, praise and accolades to all other children. So we want to make sure that our special needs children are also included in that, uh, in that kind of activity. And finally, CPAC has asked that they be invited, uh, uh, be included in district-wide committees and task force meetings uh, as appropriate. The uh, superintendent has assured that that will that will happen, that every effort will be made uh, whenever those opportunities present themselves. And uh, they have also asked that there be a CPAC liaison in each school, and it is likely that a parent of a child in a particular school could become that CPAC liaison. Uh, and uh, so there, there are ongoing conversations um, as we begin to, there will be ongoing con conversations as we begin to codify some of these 
issues into our school committee policy. There is no school committee policy that addresses CPAC issues, and so uh, we as a committee might want to recommend to the policy subcommittee uh, certain kinds of things regarding CPAC that could be embedded uh, into our policy, which of course would be brought back to this committee as well. So that, that concludes my report, and I have to say thank you very much to CPAC people and to my colleagues on the committee and all others who uh, attended, and especially to the superintendent who has um, made, readily made commitments to get some of this stuff done. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Anything on Mr. DeMello and uh, Mr. Uh, did you, uh, you guys? Oh, Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To uh, Chairperson Doherty, it seems like we just relived the whole meeting right now with those very well taken notes. Thank you. It was very explicit. But uh, uh, being uh, a second termer, I guess uh, the most uh, communication I've received as a school committee member uh, coming onto the board was issues dealing with uh, special education. And uh, I must say, as Ms. Doherty just mentioned, uh, the communication has definitely improved. Uh, and issues are getting noticed, and uh, I don't want to say taken care of quicker because everything's taken care of, but uh, communication has definitely improved. So thank you, Superintendent Cabral, for you and your team uh, addressing those, those issues uh, on a timely manner. It's definitely very nice, refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pal uh, Mr. Cabral. Uh, sorry, Mr. 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 Pulaski, then Mr. Cabral. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Carol, Madam Chairperson. Um, yeah, you captured the meeting uh, very well. We got an excellent presentation from Heather and Jojo from the CPAC. Um, and I, I think one of the take home messages was, you know, we want all of our special needs students to be included um, as, much as, as much as possible. And uh, I think putting the members of the CPAC in touch with, uh, you know, members of the PTP, student council, anybody that's planning the events for the school um, so that they can advise them on, on things that we could do, things that we could add to these events uh, to make it more accommodating, make it more comfortable so that all of our students can get involved. So uh, I thought that was a powerful message for us to take home. I appreciate your, your thoroughness in the report. Mrs. Doherty, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Doherty, I have a question uh, I don't see any questions from the members. I have a question on part of your report. It talked about, um, is that a recommendation where it talks about uh, two meetings of the year with the whole school committee? Is that what, is, or is that uh, what, a recommendation or is that uh, just what you discussed or how is that, how is that? Uh, well, we, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Souza, for that question. The committee presented that one particular item as a result of a meeting previous to a previous school committee meeting uh, with the idea that we were reporting that, that we had made that decision and were recommending that to the school committee. The assumption being that the school committee adopted the report and the recommendations. So we're assuming it'll go forward, but if the committee feels that it requires more discussion, then we certainly would be open to hear that discussion. Uh, just to remind, the law requires that the CPAC present serve, serve uh, as an advisor to the school committee around issues that they, uh, that are in their purview and requires at least one meeting with the full school committee on an annual basis. The committee, Nate, myself, and Mr. DeMello felt that more frequent meetings might reduce the concerns that are raised relatively frequently um, by letters that we all get from people who have great concerns. So we are recommending two meetings a year uh, for, have recommended two meetings a year in front of the school committee, and then this special programs committee will meet with them twice a year as well. I, I, I've got no problem with the, uh, I think it's, you guys, well, I think Point of it. information, please. Uh, Ms. Dar, um, excuse me, thank you, Ms. Doherty. I'll, I'll, I'll respond in a minute. Uh, Mrs. Almeida. From my understanding, um, with CPAC and being involved in other agencies, that the meeting is the the meeting with the school committee is the report that and Mr. Cabral can correct me if I'm wrong is the report that the uh, SPED director gives to the committee every year. That's your meeting. Um, the report from the SPED director. Um, 
I could be wrong I'm gonna, if the law changed, but that's what that was. And the past practice of the school committee was that the subcommittee meet with the CPAC at their regular meetings. So I'm not sure if the law has changed. Maybe Mr. Cabral can speak to that. Thank you, Mrs. Almeida. Mr. Cabral will speak to that, and he also has another comment. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. So um, I think what the school committee and what our special education department and our special education director have been doing uh, satisfies or meets the obligation or meets the regulation. So I don't believe there's been a violation, but can things be done differently? Is there always room for improvement? Yes, there's always room for improvement. So um, just because we do it through the presentation that our special education director does once a year, uh, that meets the regulation. But if this committee chose to do more, which two meetings a year and two report outs to the subcommittee, now, I don't see that being a bad thing. But uh, I do want to just kind of clarify as well that when I went into the meeting, one of the talking points, and I was, uh, I was pleasantly pleased uh, to learn differently, that one of the talking points was communication. But as I listened to Mrs. Mulrooney, our Director of Special Education, and the chair people from the CPAC group that were present, it really wasn't about communication and I was pleasantly surprised to learn that it was about dissemination of information. How can we, as a school system, you know, work better with the CPAC group, which again, it's a partnership, so it's not just taught in public schools, it's not just a special education department, it's a partnership. How can we collect information that the CPAC would like disseminated to the special education students and families? Also, how can we share information with the general population that the CPAC feels would be important for the general population to have? So uh, I was pleasantly surprised that it didn't focus on lack of communication, but there was a heavy emphasis on how to disseminate information. So I want to clarify for the public and for this board, I think there's a difference uh, between lack of communication and disseminating information. I was also very pleased to hear how well um, and how the CPAC, I mentioned it as well, a lot of the work that was being done with the special education department, and how well they were working together and how things have improved even during a pandemic year. And as they learned, and as the CPAC mentioned, being able for special education parents uh, to be able to attend meetings, or any parent, as we learned at parent-teacher conferences, to attend meetings remotely versus having to identify daycare, feed their family, get in a car, drive across the city, wait, and then meet with uh, teachers or meet with, uh, meet with a group. Now this pandemic has taught us that we can do things more efficiently which increased participation. So that might be one benefit to come out of this. So again, I just wanna emphasize, it's a partnership. Uh, I already spoke to uh, one of the representatives who's here tonight and we have a process that we will follow to disseminate information. It will go through the special education department, then it will be sent to my office. We'll utilize our website, We'll utilize our student information system. We're also looking at utilizing the Remind app if that's something that the CPAC can utilize. So we'll share our resources, but again, it's a partnership that we will definitely collaborate with the CPAC. And I also want to kind of remind the committee, when the CPAC does come before us, it's about the CPAC and the organization and the group. It's really not about parents coming forward with individual grievances or individual concerns regarding their own student. There's a process and there's a way to address those concerns through the building level, through the special education director's level, and if need be, through my office. So when the CPAC does report, it usually shares or presents a general report about their work uh, uh, throughout the district to support special needs families and also their work with the special education department. So I look forward to hearing how the CPAC is working in our buildings, working with our special education department, and how we can be partners in this work. So those, that concludes my comments, and that was my sense of the meeting that evening. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. Uh, I, I just have a comment on the uh, amount of meetings with the whole committee. I, two things, I think uh, two meetings is a little heavy to, be, to report out to the whole committee. Um, we have 8,000 students, and I also have to weigh in the fact that we have a whole group of students that are not on special ed that we also have to accommodate. So the information that we're going to be putting out for them during the meetings. So the two meetings a year, I, I mean, one meeting a year I think is great. But uh, two meetings a year, as, as the person, as the chair of this 
2021, 20 and 21, and also I was chair in 16 and 17. I know the superintendent, I was the, last, the, the previous superintendent and this superintendent tries to make out a year calendar, and there's a lot of items on there that uh, pertain to a variety of different subjects. So I've got no problem with, with one, but I think two is, is um, a little excessive. And I think what we should do is split the accept the report and adopt the recommendation and just split that out so we can vote on that separately. So in case it, members can vote on that as they wish. Mr. DeMello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think we just heard uh, the great strides that we have been taking um, during the pandemic of opening up the lines of communication and the collaboration and the inclusivity. Inclusivity, is that proper? Uh, but you know what I mean. And I, I don't want to lose track of that. And I, I, I think that, you know, you, you, you know the, this academic year is, is long, uh, it's complicated, and it, it, it wouldn't hurt to have an opening and a closure as far as what is being proposed, at least what was discussed in our subcommittee and with the CPAC folks. So that's where I'm coming from. I, I don't want to lose, you know, sight of this because, like I said, when I first came on, one of the most one of the issues that I had to deal with most was responding to emails and phone calls regarding special education. And I, I'll say it again, it's come a long way. And I thank the superintendent and Mrs. Mulroney and her team for making improvements. So I don't want to lose sight of that. And I think that's why we ultimately, as a subcommittee, decided that we have an opening and a closure. Thank you. Wishes of the committee on the report. Second. All those in favor on accepting the report? Aye. 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 Anything on the recommendations of the subcommittee? That was accepting the report. We need a motion for that? We do. Mo motion to accept the recommendations. How, how does the motion, should it yes. be worded? Uh, a motion to accept the recommendations of the subcommittee to? Of the subcommittee. Of the subcommittee. That. I hear a second. You're not going to break out anything on that then? I, I just asked. That includes the two meetings, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that includes two meetings. Yes. I, I asked for to be split out, but if you don't want to, that's fine. Uh, motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I oppose the motion. Thank you. Uh, moving on to. Um, so, so, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. So, that was. Seven to one? I, I didn't. No, uh, no, it was six to one. We have eight members now. I mean, Two, it was just, I'm, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> seven, seven to one. Seven to one. Thank you. Thank you. Who was your math teacher again? <laughs> it's, a it's a long night, and I've got a lot on my mind having to keep this place. Have to, that's right. Have to keep this place under control, so it's a long night. Uh, on the new business, FY22 school school budget workshop upcoming meeting is mr cabral go ahead and talk about the upcoming meeting thank you chairman souza so we have a follow-up to our first budget workshop it will be held on wednesday may 12th uh, we have it tentatively <coughs> we have it scheduled for 6 p.m but uh i would ask if the group if possible i know work schedules are complicated but if possible i will ask mrs devine to reach out to the group to see if we can meet at an earlier time if not We'll hold 6 p.m., but I'd ask everybody to please, if they can, uh, I know there are commitments already brought to my attention by some of the board members that we keep the 12th free, and we'll all, um, Wendy, or we'll send out another doodle poll to see if anybody, everybody can attend at an earlier time. If not, we'll meet at 6. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. On the next item, number item two, City Council Budget Presentation School Committee Budget Hearing. I'm sorry, Mr. DeMello, on that, on that item? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, are we definitely committed to May 12 on the FY22 budget workshop? Is that a firm date? Mr. Cabral. The way we had laid it out, we were gonna have a follow-up budget meeting on May 19th. So uh, the plan was to have our budget workshops and then go into the May 19th meeting to pretty much finalize our FY22 budget so that we'd be ready for the city council presentation, which will be the last week of May or first week of June. And then we have to have our budget hearing 
in June, which will usually coincide with the city council. But if this group wanted to meet at a later time, this is Moynihan and I, we know where to find them. So if we need to meet at a different time, we can, so we can accommodate the group if the group wishes to change. So why don't we roll the next item in as far as the council budget presentation. Do you have a date, the date that they gave you is? The, the only thing that Colleen Ellis reported to Mrs. Devine was that um, the chairman, I believe it's Chairman Crump, reported that it, it may be, well, Colleen reported that she spoke with Chairman Kite, and it may be the last week of May or first week of June, but the date has not been confirmed yet. Right. And the reason I mentioned that, Mr. Chairman, is because I know the superintendent has offered to meet one-on-one -on -one with individual members, and due to some work commitments and travel time and so forth, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's hard for me personally. Uh, so I don't know if uh, that date was firm. That's why I'm asking. I, I, at this point here, I don't know if we have, I don't know if there's physically, I don't know if that's the word, that the calendar I think is too backed up because uh, the 12th will be the budget workshop, the 19th is the a budget, another budget presentation for the committee regular meeting. That leaves the next week we could be going to the council meeting. So uh, if anyone needs to meet with the super, I think we're going to have to hold it unless there's a serious objection um, because it just seems like, um, I thought the council usually sees, sees us in June, the first week in June, but apparently they're working to start in May now. So uh, it looks like um, if anyone cannot make that meeting, we they, they could be individually with the superintendent. Mr. Uh, Mr. DeBello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, d d did we always coincide this with based on the Beacon Hill schedule? I know the House has already submitted their budget. Senate is still working on it, am I correct? Yeah, Mr. Cabral's more up to this because he's, he's in that position. He, he's been, he follows that. The only thing that we coincide with this with the state budget is um, usually with the final numbers. So we follow the process. We have a commitment this year um, from the city, uh, the budget director, Gillianus. Whatever that chapter 70 number is, we will receive that increase. So right now we know that under the house budget, we saw an increase of about $400,000 in our appropriation. So should the Senate budget increase or decrease, we'll see a change there. And then once it goes to the governor, we'll know our final number, hopefully late June, early July. So if, if on the 19th, this board, and I don't wanna throw a monkey wrench and make this more complicated for you all, but if the only topic of discussion, which is a nice problem to have, when you think about where we were last year at this time, if the only topic of discussion is to discuss ESSER two in ARP, and that we know our budget is our budget, then we can talk about the ESSER and the ARP funds at a different time, if that's appropriate, if that's what this committee wants to do. Our line item budget is pretty tight because it's rolling over everything we currently have in place. Everything in ESSER two in ARP will enhance and replace and bring back what we lost due to COVID over the next two to three years. So that's really the discussion we're having is, we're talking about how to spend federal funds that if we don't use, we'll go back to the federal government. We're not talking about cuts, we're talking about bringing things back. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you all. It's, we have a nice problem, so let's, let's figure it out. Because the sooner we figure out this nice problem, the sooner we can post and bring the supports that we need we desperately need into our buildings, into our school system. Because if you approve this, if we were to approve the ESSER ARP spending plan on the 12th, then we can stop posting these positions and start creating job descriptions for positions that don't exist yet. The sooner we hold it off, or the more we hold it off, then it just delays the hiring process for us, which means we won't have these resources in our buildings, or there's a likelihood we won't have these resources in our building to start the school year. And we know how that works. Look at last year, for example. When we approved our budget in August, we were late in bringing positions back. So we started the year without needed positions. So my concern is it's, extra, it's not extra, it's federal funding that we need to identify to spend. I've reached out to every stakeholder. The reason I wanted to meet individually with you or with small groups of you is to one, make sure you understand what we're asking to bring back the plan and how we're going to utilize the positions and also did we miss something is there something in there that why didn't you think of this or can we put this in there so that's really the the conversation that i wanted to have individually or with uh, groups of school board members without violating the open meeting law 
Thank you. And if I may conclude, yeah, I, I'm all for that spending the money, but I, I do want to spend it uh, to enhance student success. And that means teachers in the classrooms, health and safety of the students, the faculty, staff of our school system. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, if we have the money to spend, I want to spend it wisely. And I know that we're very, Mr. Cabral, I know you do a good job at spending the money wisely, and Mrs. Monaghan also. But we have to un also understand that in three years, that money is no longer there. So if we're bringing in positions that don't enhance student success and go in another direction, then we're stuck with those positions. And that's going to cost the school system a lot of money, unless they're contracted positions, OK? So I apologize for assuming that they're going to be here forever. So I'm all for student success, health and safety of our students, faculty and staff, and uh, making it uh, teachers in the classrooms. Thank yeah, you. And uh, I think the other piece, too, Mr. DeMello, is um, contracted and also how they're posted. I mean, a lot of some of our grant positions are funded as one year, two year, three year positions. So the people who take on these positions, they know that the funding will expire in a certain amount of time. So that's also a way we can have controls in place to make sure that people that we're not having to make difficult decisions in two to three years the way we did last year. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. Mr. Fiore. See, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to point out that possibly having budget meetings in May, that's how it's supposed to be done. The problem is uh, for most of the 21st century, we've been dealing with crisis management. We dealt with the aftermath of 9-11. We dealt with the aftermath of the 08 recession. and. Uh, We've been dealing with the aftermath of COVID. And as a result, funding at the higher levels has been an issue. But actually, the council is supposed to be devising the budget in May because it's supposed to take three to four weeks to pass it. And they've been suspending rules or passing it in the next fiscal year or anything else. May is when they're, is when they're supposed to do it. It's, it's nice that they, they may be attempting to at least partially do it, but uh, I know it's unusual to you because you've been involved in uh, crisis management, but I'm an old timer. I was, I was over there for 14 years, and I've been here almost 14 years, and uh, it's, cha it's changed a lot, and it's changed primarily because of crisis management. Thank you, Mr. Fair. We can always count on you to bring us the, the story behind the story, and we appreciate that. Mr. Martin. I want to refer to something Mr. Cabral, whoop, my mask just broke. Uh, something, that, uh, <laughs> something that Mr. Cabral just said, that he'd like to come out of the uh, May 12th meeting with maybe some uh, motions so that he could post some positions. And I noticed that the May 12th meeting is posted as a committee of the whole. We should probably change that to a special meeting. Because if it's a committee of the whole, it's going to have to go before the full committee on the 19th, which would prohibit him from, thank you, uh, doing anything from that during that week. I, I, I mean, I agree, but I think the committee of the whole is a better format. It gives more free flow of ideas rather than the meet, and then he can just post them the following, uh, the following week. And uh, he, he, we both uh, talked about this at, at not, at length, and we, we think the format of the committee of the whole is better to right. hit the better for the it's work. Just it's just it's another workshop, so it's it's rather than the format for formalities of a regular. It's meeting. just that whatever we decide on the twelfth, right. motion wise would have to be <coughs> would have to be approved the, at the uh, at the so subsequent. So point of information. Yeah, that's correct. Point of information. Miss uh, Miss Almeida. In the past, we did, as Mr. Martin said. We could do committee of the whole followed by a special meeting. So whatever votes you take at the committee of the whole, you can report out in the special meeting, vote again, and then that would be what we would do, and then we wouldn't have to have another meeting. That's true. Because everything's still fresh in your mind as you're doing <clears throat> that. We had done that for years. I don't know 
when about to change, but I think that might be a good idea. Yeah, that, no mo and if no tonight. motions are made, we don't need the special meeting. Right. Uh, thank you. The superintendent just informed me that he is fine with the meet with the uh, any adoption being on the 19th. So okay. um, um, I think that I think that that's the way we'll go uh, unless there's any some serious suggestion. And then what happens is that gives you two bite at the apples. You presented at the at the 12th workshop. We, we you know we can kind of hash it out, and then on the 19th. Again, it's presented again in a formal way, and then you get a second bite at the apple to vote. Or maybe you say, well, we're not gonna do that. Uh, let's look at it again. So it gives us a chance for two bites at the apple to look at it and you can vote again. Mr. DeMello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in the past, uh, didn't we have these meetings on a Saturday? And I knew they were, they were long and involved and there were all kinds of uh, whiteboards and stuff going on. Is this the same meeting we're talking about? Yeah, this is uh, the committee workshop. We right. It usually lasts about two hours, and that's what we did the other night. Yeah. But, yeah, we used to have, we had them on a Saturday before after the parent university, but it, what, it didn't happen this year. Right. So we had kind of incorporated it. We figured everyone's, with the weather getting nice because of the way the schedule falls, right. that weather getting nice, everyone wanted to have their weekends for their family time, so we figured we'd do it on uh, during a, a Right, During a Wednesday. because I, I did hear the superintendent also mentioned if we could start earlier because it could be a lengthy meeting. And now that we're proposing, as Mrs. Almeida said, or someone said, we could have the one meeting and the other one followed by it. Uh, I mean, well, is Saturday still not a good day for anybody? I, I think uh, Saturday is, is um, I know myself personally, is a tough time because of family commitments. And I think uh, I spoke to a few other people, I think it's the same way. But um, I think this is—I think this format is is a good format, unless the whole committee would decide to change that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demello. Appreciate it. The next item on, and we talked. To, the next item was number two, which is about the the council budget presentation, uh, school committee budget hearing, uh, budget presentation at the council. We we discussed that uh, during this discussion. So we'll move on to Mr. Cabral. Could you talk about the James L. Mulcahy? school ribbon cutting ceremony. Thank you, Mr. Souza. So just wanted to remind the school committee again uh, that on Friday, June 4th, 2021 at 10 a.m., we will finally have the James L. Mulcahy ribbon cutting ceremony. So I know many of you have already uh, completed the doodle poll or you have reached out to Wendy Devine to acknowledge that you will be in attendance. So we just wanna let the public know that we will be having the James L. Mulcahy ribbon cutting ceremony on Friday, June 4th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Looking forward that event it will be an active weekend for us as we have graduation on the fall on that saturday or possibly sunday due to weather thank you mr cabral and then the final item and i wrote it in here mr um DeMello is the um, revolving count so we just need well we need just a motion to have the administration uh, I don't know if you wrote it out yet. I, won't, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> uh, There's a lot to that motion, wasn't there? Um, so have the administration um, break out the uh, sub-revolving accounts in each one of those light items and also any recommendations for adding, uh, for pulling those out of the sub-accounts and making an individual uh, revolving account for any particular item. So and, moved. And then, Mr. Uh, do I have a second? Uh, well, I was just going to say, how about the motion to just edit revolving account titles as needed? Well, we should discuss it first. I mean, I think that we want to discuss it. Well, no. they're going to bring to us, we're going to ask them to edit revolving account titles as needed. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, let's amend that motion to include Mr. Martin's <laughs> motion. Absolutely. Exactly. Thank I you. We'll hear a second. Second. Second, Mrs. Fagan. Thank you. Any other additions to that motion? <laughs> Mr. Fiore on the discussion? Yeah, on discussion, um, in terms of getting changes in the auditor's office, I think uh, Mr. Martin and Ms. Moynihan will bear me out. Um, the best description is glacial. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to get uh, changes in practices and procedures, probably because they're bound by law as to, as to how they can do things. But I can tell you, even in the context of my day job, um, my, the agency that I work for does uh, grant funding for first-time home buyers. 
And most people around here probably know the Bridgewater Savings Bank and Mansfield Savings Bank recently merged to become Bluestone. And they were supposed to make a payment to Bluestone on, on the down payment assistance. And this is a grant fund. And uh, they were having trouble with the W-9. Bluestone was this, I mean, uh, Bridgewater's uh, business number was the surviving business number of the merger, but they had, uh, the way the federal government, the IRS deals with mergers, they don't issue a new W-9 until uh, a year is up. And trying to get the payment processed through that office because uh, the W-9 didn't read the same way as, as how they're going to, so uh, getting changes in line items that aren't entirely necessary could be difficult. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. Keep the number of changes to a minimum. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. Uh, that, was on dis hmm. that was on discussion, right? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Almost lost track of that one. Um, under, I'm going to continue on the new business. Uh, we're going to go back <coughs> to uh, the <coughs> superintendent's report. Mr. Cabral has one item that he needs to discuss. <coughs> I, I'm embarrassed that I forgot to mention this. So while I was going over the high school graduation plans and discussion about junior prom and prom, I forgot to mention the most <coughs> important piece. I have in my hand the name of the 2021 valedictorian and the name of the salutatorian for the class of 2021. Uh, the valedictorian is a young lady who is no stranger to this school committee. As a matter of fact, she was one of the young ladies, so young women, who presented to us as part of the group that we sent to MIT as part of the STEM program several years ago. So I am proud to announce that Olivia Dias is the valedictorian of the class of 2021. I am also proud to announce that the other name of the salutatorian is no stranger to this group. You've all worked with his father, and you know the family quite well. It's Aidan Scully, who is a salutatorian of the class of 2021. So congratulations to Olivia. Congratulations to Aidan. We are very, very proud of you. And I could not think of two finer young adults to represent the Taunton Public Schools and the city of Taunton. Well, I think that uh, the only thing I'm going to say from the chair for all of us is that's why we're all here. Those are the reasons we're here. Mr. Fiore. Thank you. I just wanted to add, uh, yesterday I had the privilege of interviewing students from the top 10% of the class for the Arlene Pace and Fidelford Scholarship. And uh, those two were, am were among the interviews, and they were among the most pleasant ones we had. Thank you, for Mr. Fiore. You've had a lot of fun this week, it looks like. <laughs> Unfinished business, action items, action item review. <coughs> Mr. Cabral has one item to bring up under there to go to your action <coughs> item list. <coughs> oh, sorry. Can't keep track of all my notes. So uh, Mrs. Devine reached out to MASC, MASC, and I believe it was Jim Hardy. So Jim Hardy <coughs> is reporting on action item dated 2520, which is have administration review which policies need updating in the policy manual. So Mr. Hardy reported that he's about halfway through the policy manual. Unfortunately, due to a family emergency, he had to put off this work. However, he expects to be back soon, and he should have the work completed in no more than a couple of weeks. So therefore, we'll have a comprehensive list of what policies need to be revised or updated, and then we can put the group back together that Mr. Barada led and go through those changes. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. And then the only thing I'll mention too, on action item 9419, the MSBA has opened up the portal, so we will be submitting a core project repair, so I anticipate those two items coming off in the very near future. Thank you. Press time, there is no press time. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We are adjourned. <laughs>